how the team feel? How the team feel? All right, all right? All right, all right. All right. Well, uh, I'm glad that you're here for team camp. We resume where we left off with a lot of power and action, and the Holy Spirit is in the house. The Holy Spirit is in the house. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad this isn't just educational hype? Aren't you glad this isn't just self-promotion and self-help? Aren't you glad that this is the Holy Spirit anointed word to you to make you a better version of you? Aren't you glad about that? Well, uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm out of breath. Um, this is my first day out of bed since Monday. Uh, I've, I've, have, have you, do you know anybody that's had that crud floating around? I just feel like somebody just took a Louisville's 33-ounce slugger and hit me right here. Kink. And so I, I just haven't been able to get out of bed. And so I just said, Lord, today I just want the energy. Just, just go, let me go one round, and I'm going to swing for the fences. And so here I am. And so it's kind of interesting. If you, if you can get a close-up, get a close-up. Can you see my notes on this page? Can you, can you see that? Zoom way in. I'm glad that I wrote the material. Otherwise, this would make no sense whatsoever. Um, but this is going to be good. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the decision-making matrix, page 47 on your workbook. Before we get started, can we stand together, please? We have the holy Purell of heaven, so why don't you reach across the aisle and take the hand of the person you're next to? And who got shocked just now? Anybody get shocked? <laughs> ah! Don't you love that? <laughs> All right. Father in heaven, tonight, we ask you to impart wisdom to us. We want to have a double dose of your wisdom because we don't want to be unwise. We don't want to learn through experiences of our own that are painful. We want to learn through the wisdom and experiences of your word and of wisdom itself. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the imparter of everything that is wise and good and true. Bless this night in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, shout yes. Yes. All right. Have a seat. We want to welcome our uh, satellite campuses. It's, it's really exciting. Um, we have a, 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 an incubating campus in Downey, California, down in uh, L.A. area. And they're watching us, so we're, we're loving you guys being with us. We also have our campus in Palm Desert and Silver Creek and Summit. Ow! Love you guys. And uh, our campus, our incubating campus in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. So uh, we got lots of folks watching us. Now, uh, if you have um, gotten behind in some of the um, uh, work in our workbook, you can go on to the website and anywhere it says Team Camp, you can click on Team Camp and the, the code word is Watch Team Camp. Is that right, Jesse? The promo is Watch Team Camp. So if you, if you type in those words, Watch Team Camp, you'll be able to catch up. Only the people that have paid their $10 for your book, you're the only people that can get on just for you. It, don't you feel special? Good. Decision making. We, uh, we want to be people that are not indecisive. I, I, I want to be a person and I want to lead a church of people that can be decisive and make decisions. Because have you ever been with someone, where do you want to go to dinner? I don't know. Where do you want to go? <laughs> what, do you, what movie do you want to watch? I don't know. What do you want to watch? What color should we paint the house? I don't know. What color do you want to paint the house? Do you know anyone? Yeah? Listen, God does not want you to be indecisive. God has made you to be a leader. Say, I am, I am. A, leader. a leader. And leaders are always and forever, amen, going to be decisive. They're going to be people that have the capacity and the ability to make decisions. Now, from the time we were uh, up to our uncle's ankles, our parents have always told us, make good decisions, make good choices, right? You've heard that. Make good decisions, make good choices. Well, I just want to throw cold water all over that. Because I don't want you to make good decisions, and I don't want you to make good choices. From, from the time our kids have been up to our uncle's ankles, we've told them we don't want you making good decisions. Because we want you to make the incremental best decisions. You see, uh, we've innocently grouped decision-making into two categories, good and bad. 
But if you broaden the matrix, if you broaden the matrix to poor, good, better, best, right? If these are incremental, if these are stair-stepped, poor, good, better, best, you will find that good decisions are one step away from a poor decision. And good decisions, quite frankly, are settling decisions. Now, in this thing called life that we live, we have a consecutive series of decisions that we make. And each decision that is the best decision gets linked to the best decision made prior. That, in, that becomes the best decision ladder and so on and so on. And if you make best decisions consecutively, guess what kind of life you have? You have a strong life, don't you? But then don't you know every once in a while when we get sloppy and lazy, we uh, take these decisions that are good or poor and we link them to the ones that are best and then our life begins to look like this, right? Anybody experience tension and pressure in your life lately? Anyone? Have a little tension, a little pressure? How many of you are single in the house? You know what it means to be pressured, don't you? Married people in the house? You know what it means to be pressured. How many of you are, are kids and you have parents and you live under their control and command? You know pressure. How many of you have children? Oh, Jesus, pass the Nike will. <laughs> right? If I was really strong and courageous, I could snap this thing, and you know that I could. Because this zip tie is not as strong as this link of chain. What kind of life are we going to live? What kind of decisions are we going to make? We're not going to make good ones. Now, today, as I aforementioned, we can see that decisions, they come in these four stations. Everyone say this out loud. Four. Can you recognize a poor decision? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, ever, you ever date somebody and you think, no, oh, what did I do? Poor decision. Now, the next step up from those poor decisions, say it out loud. Good. That's the next step up on our stair step. I hope our camera shot's getting this. Hope our camera shot is zooming in on this. Hope our camera shot's really getting close for all the people at home that are watching it. There we go. All of them. Both of them. There we go. All right. Say it out loud. Good. Because this is when we really determine that we're not going to settle. And then, when we really ascend, say it out loud. Yes. Poor. Good. I'm not that flexible. <laughs> Better. And best. All right? Aren't you glad you came to team camp tonight? Yes. All right. All right, all right? All right, all right. Luke chapter 14 Verse 28, Luke 14, 28. Jesus begins speaking to his uh, disciples. And here's what he says about decision making. But don't begin construction until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might only complete the foundation before running out of money. Some of you may remember, um, those, those that live in the state of Washington, about 15 years ago, downtown Seattle, on Interstate 5, the bridges that went nowhere. Yeah. Uh, Google, this is a fun Google exercise. Maybe you should go, go and Google it. It's so funny because people all over America were taking pictures of these bridges that just like, they were going out into the abyss of nowhere. You know why? Because our state ran out of funding. <laughs> and we couldn't finish the bridges. And they sat there for seven years. The bridges had just went nowhere. Embarrassing. There's a person who started that building and they couldn't finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the soldiers of 20,000 marching against him. 
And if he can't, he would send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. Tonight, we're going to look through a matrix. We're going to look through a decision-making matrix. Watch this. The matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Neo, take the red pill. When it comes to decision making, we are either going to miserably fail, moderately achieve, significantly ascend, or vehemently contend. When it comes to decision making, would you take a highlighter or your pencil and those, over those headers, I want you to, uh, to circle or underline, miserably fail, moderately achieve, significantly ascend, or vehemently contend. This is a matrix. This decision-making, godly construct that we'll be talking about tonight. Let's start with the first one. When we make poor decisions at the bottom of the rung, I promise you, we will miserably fail. We will miserably fail. Well, how do we do that? How do we uh, come to that place where we find ourselves making miserable failure decisions? Don't you know that it takes a long time to recover from miserable failures? You can do that. Oh, you can recover. You can come back. But don't you know it's exhausting? Don't you know it takes lots of time and energy to come back from miserable failures? And don't you know that you don't have to fail miserably? You don't have to do that. So how do we not do that? That's what I'm going to tell you. Are you ready? Do you want to learn stuff? Okay. Write this down. Making snap decisions. Making snap decisions. When we don't give ourselves enough time to consider or ponder the decisions that we make. My, my son came to me last year uh, prior to him getting his driver's license. And we, we were reading Wild at Heart. By the way, if you haven't, if that's, if you haven't read that book in your bibliography, Every man must read the Eldridge book, Wild at Heart. If you have not read it, wives, buy it for your husbands, put it underneath. Girlf girls, buy it for your boyfriends. Moms, buy it for your sons. Wild at Heart, John Eldridge. So we are reading this Wild at Heart and talking about how the emasculation of men has transpired and we need to have boys become men again. Not be wimps and wusses, but men, right? How many of you women want to marry a wuss? None. How many of you women want a man? There you go, right? So, so my son was about to be 16. He said, Dad, I got an idea. We want to drive to Palm Springs when I turn 16 with a bunch of my other 16-year-old friends and go on a road trip for spring break. How about it? And I said, yeah! Without consulting his mother. Oh, there's a bit of tension in our home. Can you imagine if uh, I actually let that transpire 
The, rem- the possible ramifications of my novice beginning son driving 1,200 miles to Palm Springs would have been stupid. I want to give you a phrase that will save your life. You ready for a phrase? Here's a phrase that will save your life. Write this down. Let me think about that. No, serious. Let me think about that. I cannot tell you how many times my, my, staff, uh, my, my staff have come to me and they said, Raj, I, uh, here's what I want to do. Will, will you give me permission to go on this conference? Hmm. Thank you for asking me. Let me think about that. There have been times my children have come to me subsequent to that trip. <laughs> Daddy, can I? You know what? Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. Would you let me think about that? Give me 24 hours and I'll, I'll get back with you. Or better yet, give me 24 hours and you come back and ask me again. Do you know that if you don't make snap decisions, you will preserve yourself from making up lost time and lost ground. Making up lost time and lost ground. It's very important that we don't make snap decisions. How else do we miserably fail? Well, we also miserably fail by making emotional decisions. By making emotional decisions. I was talking with a young gal who was at church this last weekend, and, and she was just beside herself. And I said, how was your week? And she goes, oh, it was double whammy horrible. I said, double whammy horrible, how come? She says, well, I was on my lunch break, and my boyfriend texted me and broke up with me via text. By the way, that is so Bush League stupid, lame. If you're going to break up with someone, you have the guts <laughs> to go face to face. Don't, don't text break up. That is so lame. That is just, that is so, I want to say what that really is. And I just, I'm so restrained because I'm wise. <laughs> er, er. I said, well, well, what was the double whammy? She says, well, I was at the, Tacoma Mall when he texted me and I was on my way through Nordstrom's and to make myself feel better, I bought $1,500 worth of clothes on my uh, American Express. I said, did you take the tags off? (laughs) Because you know what happens? going to happen. Her heart's going to be okay in a little while, but the visa bill is still coming in 30 days. (laughs) Right? Don't don't make emotional decisions. Don't make emotional decisions. Because those emotional decisions keep having rippling ramifications long after those decisions have been made. Long after the decisions are made, the consequences continually come back to us. Well, how else do we fail miserably? Well, we fail miserably by making independent decisions. We fail miserably by making independent decisions. By making independent decisions. Some of you may recall about um, two months ago here at the church, uh, we changed the service times. (laughs) Giggle, 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 giggle. Well, the, the funny thing is, the way we do things around here is not autocratic. I mean, I am the boss. I, I started the church. It was with our money we started the church. And basically, you know, you could say that if anyone has an autocratic say, it should be moi. But, but you know, I, I created a culture where we just don't do that here. During the summer, I was speaking at a church in Hawaii, and I, I had observed um, ministry time happening after the services. And it was so tender and so sweet. I thought, man, our church needs to have people praying for its people. How many of you think that would be a God idea, Right? Not a good idea, a God idea. But our, our, my conundrum was our service times were 8.30, 10, 11.30. And we were getting people in like turnstiles, getting them in and out of the door. So there's no way we could, I mean, I wasn't going to preach for 15 minutes and have 15 minutes of worship and have 40 minutes of prayer time. That, that was, there's no way I was going to do that. So I said, I got an idea. We're just, we're going to change this. Service times. 8.30, 10.30, 12.30. Leaving two hours, uh, leave an hour in between for a lot of egress, regress, parking, childcare. It's going to be it, it, ch- children's ministry. It's going to be such a great uh, thing for our church. And I didn't inquire; I informed our staff. 
I didn't ask anybody. I came to our staff meeting, our, our, our executive staff meeting. I said, guys, gals, here's the deal. We're changing service times. I didn't inquire of the impact of the youth ministry on Sunday night. Sorry, Chad. Where's Chad? Chad, I'm so sorry about that. Dude, I just, I clipped you. 15 yards. I, I, didn't, I didn't think about our usher and greeting team. Alan, where's Alan? Alan Jones? I'm so sorry for doing that. I didn't think about the rest of our staff who had to stay like an extra hour and a half after service. Where's the rest of our staff? I'm so sorry. Do you know what I did? I didn't inquire. I informed. And do you know what that was? A miserable failure. Do you know how I can measure that? We lost two to 300 people that have not come back yet. Oh, yeah. Ouch. How do you think I feel about that? I feel really dumb. You know why? Because I know better. That just goes to show you, even when you know better, you can make poor decisions. If we make poor decisions, we are going to fail miserably, and we do that by making snap, emotional, and independent decisions. Look at Proverbs 15, 22 with me, if you would. Proverbs 15, 22. If you're watching online at one of our satellites, I want you to begin to get ready to read it out loud. Here, we're going to read it out loud together. Ready? Here we go. Plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. Isn't that good? That's what Solomon told us when it comes to wisdom. Matter of fact, when my children uh, want to go somewhere, they have learned to inquire before inform. Our staff, when they want to do something, they inquire before they, can, they inform. Hey, I'm going to lunch. No, you're not. Is it okay if I go to lunch? Yes. Yes, it is. I'm gonna, honey, I'm going to spend $45 on a, on a scarf. No, you're not. Honey, what do you think about if I spend $45 on a scarf? I'm not so sure. Let me think about that. Now, I think all of us would agree we don't want to make poor decisions. Now, when we make the next step up, good camera shot, right? When we make the next step up, that's a good decision. Notice how close the good is from the poor. Can you notice that's only about, what, 12 inches apart? A good decision isn't very far away from a poor one. But how many know a good decision is better than a poor one? Right? A good decision is better than a poor one. So, if our decision-making matrix is incremental, we are going to miserably fail when we make poor decisions but we'll moderately achieve when we make good ones. You know, I don't know how many of you, when you were in grade school, laid on your beds at night dreaming of being average. Right? Oh, if I could just live in a mobile home with wood stove heat and have a pinto, man, I'd be the happiest person in the world. Now, nothing wrong with a mobile home and driving up. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong. It's honorable. Nothing wrong with it. But that's not what you dreamed of when you were in the sixth grade. You know what you dreamed of when you were in the sixth grade? Playing in the NBA. Being a world-class figure skater. Gold medal. You dreamed of being the first woman president. You dreamed of being a Nobel Peace Prize winner. You dreamed, fill in the blank, right? You, you had dreams, and not one of you when you were in sixth grade, if you were honest with yourself, would say, I just dreamed of being mediocre. That's all I ever wanted was to be average. Nobody. So why is there such a feeling of discontent and unrest with us when we become grown-ups? Why? Because we have settled for making good decisions. And when we settle for making good decisions, the net result is we're average in our mind, but not in God's eye. Because you see, even when we fail miserably, we're still exceptional in the eyes of God. Isn't that amazing? Aren't you glad that's the way it works? 
We see ourselves so poorly and so inaccurately in comparison to how God sees us. When we make good decisions, we're going to moderately achieve, okay? So if, you, if that's as high as you want to go and as hard as you want to work, right? If that's as hard as you want to apply yourself, then what must you do? Well, here we go. I'm going to give you the things to help you moderately achieve. Wouldn't that be a, a world's worst seller? Can you imagine that on the New York Times? How to be average in a world gone crazy. How to make 22000 a year. I mean, really? Can you imagine that not selling any copies? But if you want that, here we go. When you make decisions, okay? When you make decisions, sleep two nights. Now, do you, do you know that, some of you might think, what? Let me just explain the wisdom of this. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about your everyday decisions like, oh, crunchy or creamy, crunchy or creamy, I gotta go home. Pastor said two nights sleep, I can't choose. <laughs> Don't you love it when I'm on cough medicine? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about uh, significant decisions. My, my, my oldest daughter and I, uh, three years ago, went uh, furniture shopping. <laughs> Tina's laughing. <laughs> because Tina and I had been talking about uh, buying new furniture for our upstairs uh, living room because we had, we had uh, the furniture that... Um, George Washington salvaged from the Delaware in our house. <laughs> Not Washington, Washington, sorry. So we decided to buy new furniture, and so we were pricing it out, and she was throwing me these prices like $4,000. For a couch? Heck no! Heck no! Not $4,000 for a couch. So Tina and I, or Adrian and I, went to this one little... Uh, Hole in the wall. Uh, it didn't even have a sign out front. It's over in Spanaway. It's a, it's a good place. I mean, good, good, for, good furniture. <laughs> Some of you know where it's at. I love buying my furniture there. But uh, I, I went in there, and I, I sat on this couch, and it had a recliner in the couch on both ends. Because I wanted a recliner. Tina said I couldn't have one. And so she said, I want couches. And so I, it was a win-win. A win-win scenario, right? I said, AJ, go to the other side because there was one on the other end too. I thought there was a recliner on one side, but there's recliners on both sides. Woo! Score! And the crazy thing was, I could buy two of them for less than $3,000. Two couches, that's four recliners. <laughs> and two couches for under 3G. So I bought them. <laughs> Tina came home from getting her hair done. I said, honey, I've got some good news and some interesting news. <laughs> What's the good news? We don't have to worry about buying furniture anymore. And the interesting, I bought them with AG. <laughs> she, she weighed in heavily. So it was like, you know, a, a three-week process of, you know, because all the furniture is made in North Carolina. No, no, why is it no furniture is made on the West Coast or anything west of the Mississippi? Everything's made in North Carolina. So it was coming from North Carolina. And so it finally arrives. It, and it gets into our living room, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's just bravissimo. So I sit in the recliner, and I recline back, and Tina sits in the middle section. The, the middle section cushion throws your head forward, so you're not leaning back. In the, you're not even sitting in an upright. It throws your head forward. We never sat in the middle section. <laughs> The middle section didn't recline, and so uh, one of my other kids sat on the other side. I don't remember who it was. Was it Brittany or Jake? I don't remember. I think it might have been you, Britt. Sitting on the other side, she sat in the recliner, and so we couldn't even see each other's head, and Tina was sitting in the middle going, I don't like this already. <laughs> and see, I had the introduction to a new, um, 
a new vocabulary word when it came to furniture. I thought it was leather. Oh, no, 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 no. It was not leather. It was a new word called pleather. <laughs> half plastic, half leather. I couldn't give those couches away on eBay. And she's never let me forgot it and never let them out of our house. They're now in our basement. But every once in a while, I slip down and sit in them and lament not taking 24 hours or 48 hours of just sleeping on it. Do you know, if you want to make a good decision, take 48 hours and just, before you pull the trigger, just sleep two nights. You know what? But before you confront someone that you're really ticked off, sleep 48 hours. Sleep two, sleep two nights, not straight through. That's, that, that'd be weird. <laughs> but take two days, take two full cycles of the sun rising and setting, and just take 48 hours before you confront someone. You know, about six months ago, I was ready to tear someone's head off. In Jesus' name, out of love. <laughs> and it, I thought it was a very, very, very big deal. And to me, it was one of the things worth going to Matt. Because, you know, you can't fall on every sword, but the things that are gonna, you're going to go to Matt for, you're, you're going go to go to Matt for some things. You know, I took two days and slept on it. And on the third day, you know what? It just seemed like a really smaller deal than it was the other two days. I thought, I'm going to take one more day, and if it's, you know, if it's less, I'm going to let it go. I took one more day, slept on it. It wasn't even a big deal at all. I'm so glad. Because you know when you really violently confront somebody that you're going to make a, a withdrawal out of the relationship account? You know that, right? If you really get in someone's grill and you just lay into them, you're just going to take deposits out of the account. So before you make a decision, would you, just, would you just remember team camp and go, you know what? Not when it comes to crunchy or creamy. Hey, unscientific straw poll. How many of you would say, that the inspired form of peanut butter is the crunchy brand. Would you wave at, wave at me? Interesting. How many say, no, it's creamy. Got to have creamy. Okay. The first year of our marriage, we almost didn't make it through because we couldn't come to... Can you, can you, would you care to wager who was the crunchy and who was the creamy? If you think I was crunchy, raise your hand. If you think I was creamy, raise your hand. Crunchies win. I'm a crunchy guy. All right. If you're going to be moderately, uh, upwardly mobile in your achievement, number two, you're going to make casual inquiry. You're going to make casual inquiry. You will. You'll make casual inquiry. Hey, what do you think about? But you don't really give somebody a chance to respond. You know why? Because there's a difference between listening and hearing. Did you hear that? Dear one, there's a difference between listening and hearing. When you are sitting on the remote control button with your thumb and sitting on your pleather couch, <laughs> and your significant other begins whispering something to you, and you're, ah, oh, yeah. Be careful, because that could mean that you just bought a new dining room table. <laughs> Why? Because you heard a reverberation going into your tympanic membrane, sending messages to your cochlea that went into the synapses of your cerebral cortex, but that doesn't mean you really heard them. That doesn't mean you really listened to them. It means you heard noises. That doesn't mean that you were attentive. People that, that are going to moderately achieve, they'll make casual inquiry of other people. Hey, Rick, Rick uh, uh, represents Prosser. You saw what represent Prosser? Rick Wave. One of the, if you ever want to buy a piano or piano gear, that's your guy right there, Rick, Rick, Rick Block. If I went to Rick and said, hey, Rick, what do you think about these uh, plastic key kawaii pianos? Rick would go like, dude, those things are going to be like, you know, out of tune the first time you play the chords. But yeah, Rick, it's like $300. Well, that's why, because they're plastic key pianos. Thanks, Rick. And I go buy that Kawhi plastic key piano. Guess what I got in my living room? A piano. <laughs> Great for a decorative piece of holding vases, <laughs> picture frames, but horrible for making music, right? People that just casually 
inquire. Those are people that are going to have hit and miss successes in life. But we don't want to be average, do we? So we're not going to make casual inquiry because there's a difference between listening and hearing. And then people that want to moderately achieve, uh, they're going to live experientially. They're going to live experientially. They're going to live experientially. Uh, how many folks were here last weekend to hear Pastor Wayne Cordero speak on devotions? Wave, wave, wave. Okay. You can get wisdom from one of two ways, from your personal experiences or from others' personal experiences. You, listen to me, you have one heart in this thing called life. You have 206 bones in your human body. You don't have enough bones or enough hearts that it takes to live a life at the very top of your field by learning via your personal experiences, your personal experiences. You don't have enough bones or enough hearts, right? That's why it's so important that we don't just rely upon our own personal experiences. Take a look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. I love how he says this. This is so precious. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. You ever been there recently? And guess what? I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke, which is a, a farming metaphor, right? A yoke is something that would slip over the oxen's head and they would plow the field. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You know why? Because if you've ever been around um, that that first century or 18th century yoke that cattle or oxen, they're heavy. Those are heavy for beasts of burden. But look at what Jesus is saying. He says, take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's read verse 30 out loud together, because you need to catch this. Ready? Here we go. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus says, if you will dare but learn from me, if you will dare but learn from me, what you will find is that you will not have to have experience that's personal to help you ascend and achieve. But you will be able to have experience that is sovereign, that helps you, check this out, jump the learning curve. Right? You've all heard the saying, there's a learning curve. You start a new job, there's a learning curve. You get married, <laughs> there's a learning curve. You have children, you discover you're not an expert, there is a learning curve. But it, wouldn't it be interesting if you could jump the learning curve? Do you know that if we'll do what Jesus said, we can jump the learning curve and not have to have experience? Now, now check this out. That's only making good decisions. That's only when you make good decisions. Are you, are you feeling it? Are you feeling it? You're going to be able to put your hands on this and ascend. Because some of you are going to get the promotion by the end of this year because you're going to stop making good decisions. Some of you are going to have your marriages come to fullness and fruition because you're going to stop making good decisions. Some of you are going to have the relationship in your dating life that you want because you're going to stop making good decisions. Some of you are going to have physical health that you desire because you're going to stop making good decisions. Some of you are going to have all the money you've ever wanted because you're going to stop making good decisions. For the sake of God and everything that is good and holy, stop making good decisions. <laughs> Sounds a little bit psychotic. But only when you learn to the matrix. When we make better decisions, when we make better decisions, this is when we significantly ascend. This is what separates the men from the boys and the girls from their toys. When you 
contend for better decisions, you start to significantly ascend. It, it starts to be, it come incremental. I mean, it, it, it starts to be exponential. It's, you know, the God is not a God of addition. He's a God of multiplication. Don't you know that when Jesus fed the 5,000, he took two loaves of bread and five fishes? Or was it five fishes and two loaves of bread? I always get those confused. My, dys- my dyslexia kicks in. But Jesus takes not very much. He blesses it and breaks it, and then he adds it, multiplies it. When, Jesus, when God was speaking to Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, be fruitful and add. Mm-mm. He said, be fruitful and, Multiply. say it again, Multiply. with conviction. Multiply. Say it louder, Multiply. like you really mean it. Multiply. Don't you understand? God wants you to vehemently contend. And when you start vehemently contending for your decision making, there are no more weak links in your chain. They start to become firm and they start to become uh, ensconced with, with a, a sense of, Invincibility. Well, how do we significantly ascend? Here's how we do that. When we start making our decisions, we stop making de- declarations and we start asking interrogatives. Write that down. When you start to vehemently contend, you stop making declarations and you start making interrogatives. That's not gonna be on your notes anywhere, that's just fresh manna from heaven just came to me. Aren't you, no, I didn't skip anything. I haven't started anything. This is fresh manna from heaven, no blanks yet. When you start vehemently contending and making better decisions, you stop making declarations and you start making, say it again, interrogatives, right? You start asking questions. You start asking questions. Before you make declarations, you you ask questions. Because that's how better decisions are made. So, here's the first thing that you do when you're making better decisions. You ask yourself the question, is this a long-term or short-term decision? When I'm making significant, again, not creamy or crunchy, And we all know that God eats crunchy peanut butter because he loves that best. (laughs) But when we're making significant decisions, we have to ask ourselves the question, is this a short-term or a long-term decision? Uh, Write this down somewhere in the margin of of your notes. uh, Maybe I wrote mine underneath the block over here. It's been stated by sociologists that 80% of our decisions are in three primary arenas. Ready for this? 80% of our decisions are in three primary arenas. 80%. And now, how many know that getting a B is pretty good? (laughs) So for for you A-plus students that never had a B, that'd make you mad. But for the rest of us mortals, that's that's pretty good. That's the better decision, because it's a B, right? But if you've been failing in life, how many of you know that B looks pretty sweet? If you've been failing at relationships, a B looks pretty sweet. If you've been failing in your spiritual walk with God, a B looks pretty sweet. If you've been failing in your interpersonal relationships with your siblings, a B looks pretty sweet. 80% of our decisions are in three primary arenas. And here they are. You ready? Financial, relational, vocational. Financial, relational, and vocational. Okay? 80% of the decisions that you'll make in the course of your lifetime are in three primary arenas. They're going to have financial ramifications, relational ramifications, or your job, vocational ramifications. 80% of your decisions are in those three areas. 80%. The other 20% are in... um, I can't recall what, what they are off the top of my head because my cough medicine's kicking in, but we won't go there because I can't get it accurate. But for now, we, we want to know, know how do we then matrix our decisions 
so that in the 80 percentile of our decision making, we're not settling. We're not making good decisions. For example, financial, right? If you have a $30,000 a year salary and you make a purchase on your American Express card that's $3,000, if you make the minimum payment, you're on the hook for 10 years to pay off that $3,000 purchase. Is that a short-term or a long-term decision? That's a long-term decision. So when you sit down with your Visa card and go like, okay, I make 30 grand a year, I can only afford to make the minimum payments, and I know that I'm on the hook for 10 years to make this off, you know what? No way. I ain't doing that. Because this shotgun ain't worth killing all the birds for 10 years. All the women in the house it? Amen. Amen. You see... You begin to ask questions of your decision making, not to make you more indecisive, but so that you can rule out and relegate out those decisions that will not bring you closer to being the best you that you can make you. Because the whole target of team camp is to present to God the very best version of you. And you won't make the very best version of you by making good or poor decisions. You won't. So we ask the question of our decision making. Is this a long-term or a short-term decision? Would you like to go out with me? Sure. Okay. I know it's our first date and all, but would you marry me? (laughs) Why, yes, I will. Short or long term? <laughs> Probably short term, huh? <laughs> you see, what we do as people is we'll, we'll often overextend ourselves into long term realities with short term belief. We believe it to be short term, but it actually is rippling out into long term, right? I have this abortion, it's over and I'm done, move on. Do the interviews. Those kind of decisions weigh on people's heart. Aren't you glad that God forgives and gives grace? Aren't you glad that his mercy just washes over? His blood covers all of our sin. Aren't you glad that if his, if his, if his blood doesn't cover all of it, it doesn't cover any of it? I don't know about you, but I'm a grateful person for the blood of Jesus. But do you know what I still have in the back of my mind? The reality of my decisions that I made when I was 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. Those things are still there. Aren't you glad that God takes away the energy, but he doesn't take away the memory, right? He takes the sting out. Oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, hell, where is thy sting? No sting, but the memory, right? So we want to ask ourselves, you know what? I don't want to cause you to be a person that hedges your bets. I want you to be okay to make long-term decisions. But what I don't want you to do is start making decisions that you believe to be short-term and actually end up being long-term. Because that's when life begins to bog you down. Have you ever made the statement, I just feel like there's a cloud over my head? Have you ever made the statement, man, I just can't seem to get a break? Those kinds of statements are indicative of people who made long-term consequence decisions believing that they were only short-term consequence decisions and thereby create this constant revolving debt above their head that won't let them get ahead. And if you begin to filter your decisions through the poor, good, better, best matrix, and then within the matrix you think, is this a long-term or a short-term decision? And if you don't obligate yourself long-term when you only want short-term, guess what you have? Peace. Make sense? I bet you're glad you came tonight. I bet you're glad you came tonight. How else do we significantly ascend? Well, we start to make comparative analyses. We start to make comparative analysis. We start to make comparative analysis. I can't even believe that I'm going to say this out loud, but I am going to say this out loud. 
Before you purchase, please shop. <laughs> Tina's giving me thumbs up in the front row. Remember the couch story? Remember the couch story? You need to begin to make comparative analyses. You need to do that. You need, you need to, to, to look around, and, and you, you, need to, you need to be able to have something to compare to. That's why you shouldn't, you shouldn't marry the first person you date. You shouldn't do that. Unless God sovereignly speaks to you in an audible voice from the cloud, which has happened. Hey, it's happened. There have been victories. But for every victory that you show me, I can show you 1,000 train wrecks. You shouldn't buy the first car you test drive. Oh, there are victories. Oh, there are. But for every victory I can show you, I can show you 1,000 that have train wrecked. Do you, are you catching wisdom here? Are you, are you garnering wisdom? Are you putting it in your basket? You need to do comparative analysis. Listen, don't give your heart to the first church that you go attend. Don't do that. Don't do it. You know why? Because I don't believe that there's just any church that you should attend. I believe there's the church you're assigned to. I do. I, I believe that. I believe that God has, because of Jeremiah 29, 11, right? I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans not to harm you and to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has very specific, drafted, mechanical drawings for your life. And there is the church you're supposed to attend. And by the way, if you are attending the church that you're supposed to attend, you should be serving, you should be tithing, you should be involved, you should be praying for, you should be heart and soul, because this is not a cruise ship, this is a, this is a battleship. We need to make comparative analyses. We need to make comparative analyses. And the third way we uh, significantly ascend is we use the beneficial filter. We use the beneficial filter. <clears throat> we use the beneficial filter. Whenever, I, whenever, whenever I'm making decisions, I ask myself the question, is this a we or a me? Is this choice that I'm making, and again, beyond creamy or crunchy, right? I'm asking myself in the significant decisions that I make, is this a we or a me? Have you ever heard of the Pareto Principle? Anyone? If you've heard of the Pareto Principle, wave at me. Wave, wave, wave. Okay. Wilfredo Pareto was a turn-of-the-century uh, Italian economist. Wilfredo Pareto. He's a great read if you Google him. When communism started to sweep into Europe in the 19th century, Pareto espoused that communism would never work for many reasons, but he was an economist. And here's what he espoused. Wilfredo Pareto said that if you took all of the wealth of Europe and threw it into the streets, within 10 years, 80% of the people that originally had the wealth would have it again if they all started from scratch. It's the 80-20 rule, right? Now, from the Pareto principle, here's the principle that I have extrapolated or pulled out of the Pareto principle. Now, now catch this, catch this, catch this, catch this, because this is going to, like, for some of you, it's going to be like a firm loofah across your tender burnt skin on the Hawaiian seashore. <laughs> How's that for a word picture? When it comes to the beneficial filter, I use the 80-20 rule, the 80-20 rule. 80% of my decisions must be we. 20% of my decisions are afforded to me. Okay? 80% of my, now I'm going to cooperate this with Scripture here too very shortly. This will blow your mind where I'm about to go in the book of James. 80% of my decisions must be we. 20% are permitted to be me. Are you familiar with the term narcissism? For those of us that are not familiar with the term narcissism, a narcissist is someone who thinks that they are the sun and all the planets revolve around them. Do you know any narcissists? 
that's enough said. <clears throat> we know some narcissists, don't we? The world spun, just spins around them. And if the world ain't spinning around them, they ain't happy. Matter of fact, they're a little crabby. Have yourself a crabby little Christmas. You know, because their heart is not happy. A narcissist just wants everything to be given to them and everyone to serve them and has everything around them. Can I give you a little acronym that I filter through my decisions? This is a great acronym. The acronym of JOY, J-O-Y, Jesus, Others, Yourself. In priority, Jesus, Others, Yourself. And you know what? If you live with that kind of acronym, you will have JOY. In your life. Jesus said, whoever wants to be the greatest in the kingdom of God must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. That's not very sexy in the marketing world, is it? Hey, you want to be the best in the kingdom of God? Pick up a cross, walk around naked, beaten to death, and follow Jesus. Not many people jumping on that bandwagon. The 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule using a beneficial filter, reaffirms what James said in James chapter 3 and verse 16. James 3, 16. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Here we go. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Anybody experiencing drama in your home at all? Anybody have friendships where there's just drama, Anybody have a workplace where there's drama? Anybody have a, ever been to a church where, where there's drama? You know, you think of all the places in the world where there shouldn't be drama, there, sh- there shouldn't be drama in church, right? It's like, come on, good God, for the sake of everything that is holy and righteous and true, let me come to church and let there be just one place where there's no drama, right? There should be no drama in the house of God. There should be godliness of order of leadership and how your leaders lead where there's at least one place on the map where there's no drama. Right? Well, the challenge is that's not very realistic (laughs) because we're all pretty mortal. But the the least amount of drama should at least be in the house of God. That's where the least amount of drama should be. Listen, I'm a mortal guy and I blow it and I mess up and I have to apologize lots. Remember our our, our first pass of teen camp, I think it was in week two, right? I talked about the uh, apology principle. I, I find one person a day to apologize to, right? And if you think that there's not one person a day that you haven't offended and can apologize to, you're, you're a narcissist. <laughs> if you want no drama in your life, live the JOY acronym. If you want no drama in your life, live the 80-20 rule. If you want to vehemently ascend the ladder of success, come on, this is all about the beneficial filter. we, 20% me. Because I don't want you to become some kind of martyr that that, that embraces the the, the poverty mentality. Oh, the poorer I am and the wretched I am and the least I have, the more God loves me. That's just as wacky as as the prosperity gospel. Both of those are whacked out extremes not intended by God. Okay? Many people will take all of Scripture, break it into about three chapters of the New Testament and say, good God, this is the word of God. Everyone should be rich and healthy and blah, 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 blah. That's whack. Everyone should be poor and living without and have nothing and be the least. That's just as whack. Paraphrased. Okay. Now, we've learned how to miserably fail. (laughs) I didn't need a class on that. I was doing fine without your lecture. We've learned how to moderately achieve. Hey, if I want to be average, I got the steps down. River dance. If I want to significantly ascend and separate myself from the rest of the pack, hey, this is something revolutionary that maybe I haven't thought of before. But now, (laughs) you know where I want to live? I want to live my best life now. I, I, I want to be the very best version of me humanly possible. And in order for me to be the very best version of me, there can be 
no weak links in my chain. If I'm going to be the very best version of me, I've just got to have best decision after best decision after best after best after best after best after best after best. And then you get a chain that ain't breaking. Isn't it interesting? You know, Andrew Carnegie, Vanderbilt, these people all went through the recession, right? They kind of landed on their feet. Ford, they went through the recession. They went through the depression. When our economy collapsed in 1929, they landed on their feet. Why? Best, 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 without better or good or, God forbid, poor. You're going to go through hard times, and it's going to be hard in your thing called life, because that's called life. But listen, here's how we vehemently contend. Are you ready? Because <laughs> that's what I do when I'm really excited. And Chad, you better not be on Sports Tap following the Huskies. Are you okay? You're DVRing, okay. Who else? Luke, are you on Sports Tap? He's on vacation. Where's Andrew? Sports Tap or no? Okay, all right, all right, all right. Just a second. <laughs> Those of you that are not uh, on Thursday night but you're uh, on DVD, good for you. Um, <clears throat> here's the first thing we do to be immediately content to make best decision. Number one, we fast and pray. Appropriate time for appropriate use. We fast and pray. So many people will, will go to great lengths to interview women of power, men of position, masters of industry. They would give great amounts of wealth to sit with people at the tops of their field for one hour of their time. When we came to Puyallup, it's exactly what I did. I researched and found the top 10 pastors in Pierce County. I offered them $100 for one hour of their time, and I would buy them lunch at Stanley and Seaforts. I bu- and it was coming out of my pocket, my own personal money. Because you know what? I wanted to learn from other people's experiences and wisdom so I didn't have to reinvent the wheel and I could jump the learning curve. And I, I did it. I, I, I coughed up a thousand bucks to sit with the best leaders in Pierce County and I bought lunches and I took notes. And you know what? I can tell you that, that, that this church just blew by experience by trial and error and broken bones and broken hearts because we jumped the learning curve. We just blew by it from the wisdom of other leaders that have already tilled up the soil. Why should I have to reinvent the wheel? Right? But do you know what else we did prior to and subsequent to that? We got on our knees and we sought the heavenly resources of heaven. The one who sees time, past, present, and future all at the same time. We denied ourselves physical food and didn't eat for stretches of days. Which, by the way, we're going to do this year as a church, uh, 21 days before Easter, we're gonna do a Daniel fast. We, we fasted and prayed and sought the face of God. And you know what? Th- th- there was, <laughs> it was so funny because we wanted to name this church. Now check this out. We wanted to name the church Silver Creek Church. <laughs> yeah. And I was, and I, that was my idea. But you know why? Because that's back when Willow Creek was like really blowing up in Barrington, Illinois, and Willow Creek had such a cool sound. I thought, Silver Creek, that was so cool. And we had never been to Puyallup, but we moved into this development called Silver Creek, right? And started the church in our home Bible study. And I thought that there was a literal river, a body of water called Silver Creek. It was the name of a housing development. Can you imagine if we named the church Silver Creek Church, how it would have hemmed us in because the people in Jim Heights would have hated our guts. <laughs> the people in Sunrise would have hated our guts. Well, I don't like Silver Creek. I like Sunrise. 
we would have eliminated a whole demographic of people, but we fasted and prayed, and God said, don't you dare do that. We, we wanted to have our church in Brulette Elementary, in Brulette Elementary, which is up by Silver Creek. And I thought, man, it's so perfect. A new neighborhood going in right next to a brand new school. And it was available. And we were so excited. One problem, there was another four-square pastor in town who was here a year before us and said, no, I've staked out that territory and claim it as my own. You guys can't go there. Oh, I was so angry. You know, I wasn't remotely sounding like Jesus. But I went to Jesus and I fasted and prayed. And he said, don't worry, I've got a place for you. We were given a window. Here, 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 here was our territory. When we went to Foursquare, we said, well, then where can we go? Well, you can go anywhere from um, Shaw Road to Canyon, and you can go as far south as, as 116th and as far north as 112th. <laughs> I, I said... I'll be about as good as a one-legged man in a butt-kicking contest. There ain't no way I can do a church in that narrow rectangle. Are you kidding me? But God knew that Ferrucci Junior High School was right in that rectangle. And we had to drive all the way down Meridian and get into Ferrucci Junior High School and set up and tear down from our, our minivan and little SUVs and trucks that were coming with all of our equipment. Set up and tear down every weekend. But we fasted and prayed, and God said, Roger, I've got a spot for you that's not going to look optimum, but trust me, it's going to look optimum. Roger, i got a name for you, Puyallup Foursquare. Well, that's not very sexy. <laughs> that's not going to wow anybody. <laughs> oh, but don't you know that God knew? And because we fasted and prayed, we didn't hem ourselves in at all. And our branding and marketing is now is worldwide. And we're known as Foursquare Church. And we have Foursquare Silver Creek and Foursquare Summit. We have Foursquare Palm Desert. We have Foursquare Columbia, South Carolina. We have Foursquare Downey, California. And the rest and the best are yet to come. Why? Because we fasted and prayed. Now listen to this. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. Matthew 17, verses 14 through 21. And this is in the King James Version because uh, I like how this, how this poetically reads. We don't read out of the King James Version very much because it's 16th century English and people don't talk this way anymore. But I like this structure. And w- verses 14 through 21, chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son for he's a lunatic. Any parents ever felt that way about your children? (laughs) I love that. And he is sore vexed, for oftentimes he falls into the fire and oft into the water. Why? Because he was demon-possessed. Have you ever thought your kids were demon-possessed? And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. How would you like your boss to talk to you that way? You faithless and perverse workforce. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and the devil departed out of him. And the child was cured that very hour. Someone say amen. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible for you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Guess what the disciples didn't know? They didn't know the price they had to pay in the fasting and the prayer accounts, making deposits inside of them so that when it came time to make the withdrawal from the account, they had power to draw from because fasting and prayer make deposits in us. And when it comes time to make the withdrawal, we say in Jesus' name. And someone who's not been praying and fasting says in Jesus' name. And someone who has been praying and fasting in Jesus' name, guess what? The scales, they ain't the same. Do you understand? There, how many of there's power in Jesus' name? There's power in Jesus' name. But when you're praying and fasting, the scales are not the same. And if you're going to make best decisions, before you take that job offer, sir, 
you better fast and pray. Before you say, I do, ma'am, you better fast and pray. Before you sign off that letter of intent to go to University X, you better fast and pray. Before you start dating that certain someone, you better fast and pray. Before you make the move into that next house, you better fast and pray. Do you understand? This is how best decisions are arrived at. This is how best decisions are hooked together in the chain link of life. And if we don't fast and pray, we will not make best decisions. Period. End of song. But once we start fasting and praying, do you get it? Once we start fasting and praying, then when we pray in Jesus' name, there's this turbo engine. I had a Mustang convertible about six, seven years ago. And it was a little six-cylinder. Had a little nice little convertible thing to it, and I liked it. But it was like, man, you know what? I made a better decision because I didn't wait because I really wanted the Cobra. <laughs> yeah, because it was a lot faster and a lot more muscle. I went away on a trip, and we had this car, and Tina, my, my wife, for my birthday, she sold her car, whoosh, did away with it, took the excess money, traded my car in, and in the garage, there was a cover over my car, as the, as the cover usually was, and I walked in to the garage from my trip, and I looked at the wheels underneath the cover, and I go like, oh, that doesn't look the same. I pulled the cover off of that car, and I nearly wet myself. Because alongside that passenger emblem was this cobra insignia. <laughs> I still get excited about it. And I didn't even, I, I ran in and hugged my wife, swung around and said, do you mind? She goes, get out. I laid a patch of rubber down my street that was 75 feet long. I was so happy. Because <laughs> in my other Ford Mustang, I, I tried to gas it and I'd get beat off the line by a VW bug. <laughs> but underneath the hood, those cars, you park them side by side, they look almost identical until you start revving up the engine in that Cobra. And honey, let me tell you, the power there was unbelievable. The reason why we don't ascend to best is because we don't pay the price to get the higher octane fuel, and we don't have the higher, octane, the higher, the higher uh, horsepower engine underneath the hood. But if you want that higher horsepower, it's through prayer and fasting. Okay? You understand? Okay. And finally, in order to make best decisions, in order to make best decisions, we need to live with walkaway power. Ah! Solicit expert experiences. Solicit expert experiences. Kind of already talked about that a little bit with the other uh, pastors that we talked to. And then finally, live with walkaway power. Live with walkaway power. I, I think some of the best decisions in life are the ones not made. Did you hear me? Some of the best decisions in life are the ones not made. I've done hundreds and hundreds of weddings. Literally, I've lost count. I don't know how many I've done. But I do remember uh, one particular wedding 16 years ago. I was a young, young pastor back in those days. Young, young. I was 30. And there was a wedding that I did, and it was in Redmond. And I, it's always my... It's always my uh, tradition to go in and pray for the bride before the wedding day. And brides are okay. It's their moms that are nuts most of the time. <laughs> I've had to pull a few moms off the ceiling. Moms of the brides. You'd think, you know, but there's a pattern. Oh, there's a pattern. But this particular young lady, um, I was looking into her eyes, I was holding her hands, I said, are you ready to do this? And she began to have a tear, and I thought, boy, she's so excited to get married. 
I, I saw the hesitation and I said, you're not sure about this, are you? And she broke down and she cried. I said, sweetie, you know what? You don't have to do this. If you think you're not ready, it's better to walk away right now. Shut it down. All those people and all those invitations and all that cake. I said, you know what? It's not going to matter as much two years from now if you say no now. But two years later, if you say no, there's going to be a whole lot more consequence attached to your decision. And if you're not ready for this, shut it down. But my dad's paid so much money. Money will come and go. This is your life. Your dad will understand. She didn't have the courage, and she went through with the wedding. The wedding lasted. The marriage lasted four years. And it was four years of hell for she and her man. Some of the best decisions you will ever make are the decisions that you don't make. Living with walkaway power. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a car dealership showroom floor, <laughs> almost ready to pull the trigger. <laughs> After two and a half hours of a heavyweight bout, you know what I'm talking about, right? Two and a half hours, slugging it out, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Sorry, it's not going to work. And just walk away. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat on a real estate transaction looking at purchasing a home, getting right up to the point of signing docs, and I've got that little thing in my tummy going, mm-mm, poor good, better, best. This might get you by, but this isn't golden. Can I tell you how many times I've sat with my friend at the blackjack table <laughs> and he just didn't have the willpower to say, let's go cash him in. And he'd go walk home empty-handed with nothing in his pockets. Not that I go play blackjack all the time, mind you. There are decisions that you have to make when it comes to walking away. There are sexual temptations where Paul tells Timothy, don't walk, run, you fools. <laughs> to quote Gandalf the Great. Living with walkaway power causes you to make the best decisions humanly possible. With sovereign anointing. My dear friends, What kind of life do you want to make for you? A life that's hooked with best to best to best to best to best to best. And every time there's a breakdown, you can find the one that has the weak link. As for me and my house, we will, we will serve the Lord. And we're going to make best decisions and we're going to ascend to be the very best version of us humanly possible with sovereign anointing upon us. Are you with me? Are you with me? How do team feel?